on March 18, 1990, the most audacious art heist of all time took place at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Two men dressed as police officers were admitted into the building by security, claiming to be responding to a disturbance call. In 81 minutes, 13 pieces of art were stolen. Among the portraits stripped from their frames were works by Vermeer, Degas, and Rembrandt. Estimated at half a billion dollars, the heist has been categorized as the largest and most frustrating of all time. Theories of their whereabouts and those who perpetrated the crime are abundant. In this podcast series, we will dig as deep as possible into the case, the theories, and the social and economic impact the greatest unsolved art heist of all time had on the community. This is Empty Frames. Welcome back to Empty Frames. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing so well today. I couldn't be better. I'm pumped about this episode. How are you? Ah, so pumped about this episode, Lance. It's been a while since we've been on these airwaves, uh, in case you aren't following this in real time. Um, But it's been a few months, and uh, a lot has gone down, which we will get into in other episodes. We've got a few left in the last dance, Lance, in uh, in this season. Well, we had a couple of really good episodes with Charles Pinning and Pamela Wall. They had worked on an alternative theory about the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum heist, which involved uh, sort of performance art, which is a really good theory. I still like to um, consider it as one of the theories, uh, one of the solutions to who actually stole the artwork. But today we have on a very special guest who has worked within Scotland Yard. He's a rock star when it comes to art recovery and art detecting. Charles Hill. Mr. Charles Hill joined us, and he kind of refocused the whole thing for me. I don't know about for you, but he put a put a bit of a refocus on it for me. I would say so as well, Lance, and he brings some thoughts and theories and, and true work um, that we haven't really had uh, in, in these airwaves, especially uh, lately. I mean, we've been talking a lot about the recovery effort and Charles Hill, Charlie Hill, is someone, as you said, Lance, he's got an incredible history in art crime, in recovering stolen pieces of art. Just Google him. You'll find it out. And we talk about several of the pieces of art that he helps recover. He helped recover uh, during his work. And one of them was The Scream, um, the famous painting. So uh, he's legit. And what he has to say about the Gardner heist is very compelling. What really struck me about his theory regarding the Gardner heist was his explicit repeated concern that he wanted to make sure the people whose names have been associated with the theft do not remain tarnished. He, he wanted to make sure that their reputations were intact and they could rest assured that their names would no longer be associated with it including known criminals, including people that we've spoken about in criminal organizations, he says he knows who took the paintings. It's sort of irrelevant at this point, but it's entirely possible to get the paintings back. And again, he repeated, those who have had their names associated with this should rest assured that their reputations will not be tarnished any longer. And Lance, Charlie Hill was also in the BBC documentary that came out recently. It's called The Billion Dollar Art Hunt. And uh, and it, I, I loved it. I really enjoyed watching it. Uh, Charlie wasn't as keen on it as, uh, as we are because, uh, you know, granted he's in it and, and it was a much different experience being in something like that and then watching it because I think it was also recorded a while ago. So I could see his point there. But from for us, just Gardner heist people who are interested in the subject, very compelling documentary. Yeah, there were three people on that interview and two of them liked the documentary. Uh, and <laughs> Charlie Hill was not one of them. Again, for all the reasons that you, you stated, uh, he didn't like how these pieces of media always goes towards the people whose reputation he's concerned about. Okay, so let's get to this interview. I think it's really great. I don't want to waste any more time here, Lance. Um, And we talk a good deal about his background in the interview, which I'm sure you're going to find fascinating. So uh, let's throw it to our interview with art investigator Charlie Hill.
Charlie Hill. How are you today, Charlie? Well, I'm keeping a sense of humor. Thanks. That's that's good. That's really all one can do in these times is keep a sense of humor and just keep plugging away. Uh, thank you uh, for taking the time to join us on Empty Frames. You are probably one of the most important guests we have had on this show uh, covering the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist. And uh, we're really humbled to have you here. Um, can you give a little background for the listeners who might not know your exact uh, history, your background, and I guess maybe your qualifications? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching my mid-70s, so this could be long and boring, but I'll try and keep it succinct and short. I was born in England, but when I was seven, I went to live in San Antonio, Texas. And as a child, just moved around a lot in the States and Europe, Western Europe. My father was in the, well, when I was born, he was the U.S. Army Air Force, but it became the U.S. Air Force the year I was born. And he was a career officer. And uh, anyway, I was a camp follower along with my sisters and mother. And I went to, um, you know, high school and then off to university and I hated it. So I volunteered for the draft in the late 60s, 1967, and was drafted and um, spent a, a year in training and down in the 82nd Airborne down in Fort Bragg in North Carolina. But then I uh, went to Vietnam and I was in the Central Highlands for a year, my tour of duty then was in the 173rd Airborne Brigade. And I came back and went back to school uh, to George Washington University. I did very well and um, won a Fulbright scholarship to Trinity College Dublin, hence my Irish connection. And um, I, I married a Dubliner. And um, so I have a, you know, a strong family connection anyway to Ireland. And uh, I had a couple of years of the GI Bill money come in and I went to the University of London, to King's College London, and studied theology, thinking I might, well, certainly was considering becoming a, a, an Anglican clergyman, Episcopal Church, you know, Church of England kind of guy. And then I, um, and when the money ran out, I joined the Metropolitan Police here in London. And I was a police officer for just over 20 years. And I specialized towards the end. I, I went up through the ranks fairly quickly. I got to what's called Detective Chief Inspector, um, uh, and I, where, where I spent uh, s seven years. And then, um, and during that time, I did a lot of undercover work. Right? overly promoted for that but um i did it and was successful recovering pictures like the scream in oslo that had been stolen in 1994 and things like that and also in 1994 I'd, after recovering the scream i took my family on vacation to cape cod and i went up to boston to see dan falzone who's in the special agent uh, with responsibility for the gardner museum i went to see dan falzone and told him what i thought because i had been involved in some high profile uh, art recoveries and um, from, from major art heists uh, successfully. And uh, I told him what I thought, and I said I suspected there was an Irish connection to this uh, theft uh, for a variety of reasons. I told, I went through them with him, and I mean, you know, he was, he was open-minded, certainly, as in fact have been Anthony Amore, and um, who's the head of security at the Garden Museum, and Jeff Kelly, who's been dealing with the, um, the case for a good 15 years, if not longer. And so I um, I just pursued my own angle, and um, Anthony Amore at the Gardner Museum has told me that uh, there's nothing um, to suggest in hard evidence that these things are in Ireland, uh, these masterpieces and the other works of art that were stolen. And I guess I should say or could say that I'm not a hard evidence kind of guy. I, uh, hard evidence is important, but by and large, I am um, ideal. Uh, my scientific method is to, you know, follow my hunches. That's it. Uh, is that a nutshell enough? <laughs> that's great. Oh, that is that's a great nutshell. I know. In reading some background on you, I, I wondered if you were uh, the most interesting man in the world. I thought he was going to show up with a Dos Equis. <laughs> Yeah, your connection between Europe and America is is fascinating to me. And and you were in Vietnam, and I read one article where it said you were kind of known um, through w with your other uh, your soldiers um, around you. But you were good at dodging bullets, um, and I think that was when it, when it real when I realized you might be the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> well, I, no, I, uh, yeah, I was very lucky, and and towards the end of my tour of duty, there were some guys in um, the squad I was in who um, once mutants, so there was a slight mutiny and they said they weren't going anywhere without me because they wanted to, you know, they thought, I th they thought my luck was catching or could be catching. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't, when I, when you say dodge bullets, I mean, I didn't run away from anything, but I, I was, I was extremely lucky. That's for sure. 
I think it's very important to identify when when you know you're lucky you know when you when you know like this is luck this is this is a a stroke of luck and and i i and i know that it's a lucky situation i think it's important to identify that i also think it's important to identify when you have a gut feeling like you said you had this you know call it a gut feeling that um there was a I- ireland connection uh with the stolen paintings can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because we've heard a lot about Vermeer's really being sought after by, I guess, the IRA. But um, we're just a couple of podcasters who don't have connections into the uh, into the scary underworld of s- uh, criminal syndicates. Um, wh- where do, where's your uh, gut feeling? Sort of where, where's the genesis of that? Well, I, I I don't have an answer for that. But one thing I do have very strong feelings about, and it's this. The IRA had nothing whatsoever to do with the theft of those paintings, nor in fact did the Italian mafia, the Irish, you know, the, the Irish Americans in Boston and the um, Italian Americans in, in, in New England uh, were just as organizations, or, you know, there was no paramilitary sanction from the IRA. There was certainly no um, organized crime uh, motivation or, or, or work at it. To um to steal those things, it was it was done entirely by two fre- freelancers. You can call them freelance Comanches if you like. I mean, they just you know they, they went beyond their 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 organizations, and and I believe both men were were, were Irish, um, County Monaghan men, in fact. And I think that um the uh, the the fact that they had they were essentially on R and R in the New England area at the time uh, meant that. Anytime one talks about, you know, the, maybe this is an, there's an Irish connection to the theft of the Gardner Museum on the night of St. Patrick's Day, 1990, um, it, it's, it's a mistake to think it had anything directly or even indirectly to do with the IRA. It was done by two individuals. And I've worked on that ever since I, you know, realized that this was not a, an, any kind of organized crime or par- paramilitary operation, nothing of the sort two people and then tragedy struck in the late 1990s when one of the two the the the, the dominant of the two who went into the museum and stole those things um died he died in in, in amsterdam and presumably murdered and um his body's never been recovered although i have promised the family i'll do what i can to try and recover the body but ever since this COVID thing broke out i just haven't managed to get across to um to the netherlands however um when it gets when I get back to the to why I think the uh, those paintings were stolen, the, the paintings are two other objects. Um, one was the finial, the, the eagle of a regimental uh, banner to a, one of Napoleon's Imperial Guard regiments, and the other was a Chinese and an ancient Chinese beaker uh, with a name I, I'm bound to mispronounce. I think it, it looks like it's spelled Gu and it's pronounced Ku, but anyway, those those are two objects in addition to the pictures. I call it goo. I, I, I heard someone say goo, and I've heard someone say coo. I just have more fun with the word goo. Well, there's a, there's a brand of you know chocolate dessert in this country here in London called goo. <laughs> <laughs> certainly isn't that. Anyway, listen, <laughs> joking aside, the one thing that I'm certain of is that the whole heist, the whole art heist from the night of St. Patrick's Day, 1990, or the early, morning, early hours of March 18th, uh, has been characterized by by both mistakes and, and tragedy and, and the thing is now just to get these things back and and to allay the um, fears of people that their reputations are going to be um, imperiled somehow by the recovery of these things they're not it's 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 a straightforward matter of getting them back to where they belong and getting them you know properly conserved and restored because they're bound to be um, be damaged I, I think that's for certain so much to address here in that uh in that answer um you're fairly certain probably to a hundred percent that the two men were from ireland and you mentioned the county uh but i didn't catch what county it was what what county did you say it's a county that borders northern ireland it's called monaghan clint eastwood regards himself as a county monaghan man really he doesn't strike me as a county monaghan guy he's more of a uh cork guy to me (laughs) (laughs) that was the only other county i could think of off the top of my head county monaghan is it carmel where he used to be the mayor i can't remember yeah that sounds right 
<laughs> sure, that sounds that sounds right. But you said one of the men has since died. Was that was that some sort of a hit? Was that crime related? And you said that that was in the Netherlands. And so you're 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 ver- fairly positive that these are the two that went into the museum. In in, in fact, uh, sadly, they're both dead. One, one died of overwork, and the the other was probably murdered. 1998, and the um the other brother the uh, died in in. I'm trying to remember, 2014, I think it was. Oh, they were brothers. Yeah. Wow, and and so you were told by by someone that that it was them, or by by one of them. Yeah, I, I managed to speak to the um to, to the brother who died in 2014 before he died. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't a conversation where he gave a full and frank confession, and it was none of that nonsense. But he did say to me if uh, he'd help me if um I helped him. Re- uh, you know, locate his brother's body in 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 Holland. What did he provide to you as uh, evidence that he was one of the two responsible for the actual theft? Did he give you locations or uh, details that weren't published? Nothing. No, 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 nothing like that. The the fact that I was able to contact him meant that he realized that somebody had worked out who had done it, and um, and he was you know very gentlemanly about it, and. and you know, as, as open as a man like that, you'd expect a man like that to be, which was not very open, but, you know, he was, he, you know, he was polite and um, and seemed interested in, in my abilities to, um, well, he, as he thought, which I'm still working on, locate where his brother's body is. I see. So they were in Boston in 1990. Uh, what brought them there? Do you know? You know, I, I think, God, I was up saying too much i think they were they were based in providence rhode island rather than boston okay and they were there for um criminal or activity or was it like a family getaway yeah it was more family getaway they're there essentially for rest and recreation okay okay yeah it, it was it was the, it was a bad time in the troubles in, in 1990 and um you know periodically people would um leave ireland and and, and the safest and best place to you know relax and Recharge your batteries was um, the Boston area. Gotcha. Wow. Uh, well, you're kind of blowing my mind right now um, with uh, you know a mi- missing person um, plot too. Um, we cover missing people on, uh, on on different shows that we do. So uh, yeah, my my mind is kind of racing. Um, so I guess wh- wh- where does that bring us to now? Uh, since since both brothers uh, are now deceased, what path does the artwork have to um, to be recovered? Well. That's a good question because that is what I'm focused entirely on is, is the art, recovering the works of art. And, um, you know, it's still, you know, pay my respects to the, to, to the brother who I, who I did speak with about this, um, admittedly only once, uh, you know, I did write to him and, um, and, and he responded positively and constructively to my mind. And so I think that, um, it's it, it's a tricky problem, but I don't think anybody, other than the the the, the brother who whose plan it was and who um, then had these all these um, pictures and those two other things um, trend, uh, you know conveyed to Ireland. I think from what I've put together, the I could be wrong, of course, but they were they were containerized and um, they left to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and went in a container to Limerick. County Limerick, and, um, and they were taken from there to to where they were eventually and hidden. So th- that's what I'm doing at the moment is, is is working out where they could be. And I and I think in the past year since that dreadful docu- TV documentary has been um, um, broad uh, broadcast recently, but, uh, but since it was made over a year ago, and, and when I, I just walked out on it, I just thought it was too childish and stupid, too childish of that to have anything more to do with it. Um, in addition to the mendacity and the meretriciousness of the whole damn thing, I think that um, as far as I've got so far in locating where these things may well be uh, has has progressed significantly. Um, of course, I, I don't want those people at you know BBC television documentaries to know this. So I, I'm sure I, you and and your uh, listeners can keep a secret. I, you know, <laughs> we're moving. I'm moving along quite well at the moment. I don't want all the you know. <laughs> Having stepped in what I regard as a lot of crap on my shoe, I'm sort of, you know, that's past, you know, that's a year, ago, year gone now. And, and, I'm, and I'm moving, I think, in the right direction. Well, that's great to hear. I'm seeing a man tomorrow. 
um, you know, to, to progress it even further. So, you know, it's, this is a day, not, if not exactly a daily thing, it's frequently. Is um, recovering stolen art a little bit of a waiting game with uh, having to wait around for the, the timing to be right? Yes, I certainly agree with that. It's, um, I think patience is a, patience is supposedly a virtue, but it's certainly, as far as trying to recover masterpieces in particular, it, it's something you have to do cautiously and, and deliberately. And also, you, in, in this particular case, you want to make sure that any damage that's been done to them, nothing further is done to damage them. And also, in this particular case, given the nature of some of the people involved in the past and, and those who have taken interest in it at the present for reputational purposes, you know, they're, they're not people you want to screw around with. And, um, and I think that um, to, to ensure that nobody gets either maimed or murdered, including myself, you know, is a good idea. It's an interesting point that you raise, uh, the dangers that come along with it, uh, balanced with the patience, because I guess uh, what's going through my mind right now is how you maintain uh, being patient, not not pushing too far, uh, including even doing this interview, because like, how far do you put yourself out there so that it's intended, like so that the intention is for certain ears, the right ears to hear it? But you don't want all, you know, you, you don't want all the information out there. So how do you balance like that? Per, how, do you, how do you know where to draw the line there? What are, what are the parameters? Uh, I'm sure it's case by case, though. Yeah, I mean, in this particular case, I just, you know, I, I, you know, I teeter along. And as long as I don't, you know, fall off the log across the rushing stream below, I should be OK. But I mean, yeah, sure. You know, I've got to keep my balance. And I'm not a, you know, high wire, tra- you know, trapeze artist or anything like that. So I, you know, I, you know, I, I take one one step at a time deliberately, and and I'm also aware that um, reputationally there are a number of people who do who do not want their reputation impaired, either their personal reputation or more significantly their um, the, you know, the, the, their national, the Irish nationalism, to be in any way considered to be at fault here because it, it's not. I mean, you know, you've got to be straight with people. Um, this has got nothing to do with Irish nationalism. It's a, it was a freelance v- venture that had, has gone over the last three decades wrong. Um, and, um, and, and I'm uh, competent enough as well as experienced enough to, to be able to deal with it. And, um, and I, you know, I, have a, I believe a good relationship with Anthony Amori, the head of security at the Garden Museum. And although he thinks I'm, you know, I'm wrong, and as he says in his own words, he's in lockstep with the FBI, a special agent Jeff Kelly on this. They they, re, they think things are in New England, in in, in the Boston area, um, and I don't. But you know, they're, they're courteous enough to let me do my thing, which is which I think is um, you know, I think they respect me enough for to allow me to you know to take the take my own lead in this. They don't think it's going to go anywhere, but you know, but as Anthony said to me, and more than once, certainly once. Um, these things aren't back on the wall yet, so he's willing to listen to me. That's good to hear that he's open-minded about that. He's obviously um, doing the right thing by trusting you in your investigation. And you were part of Scotland Yard. I mean, that's a pretty good uh, bit to be on your your resume if you want to, you know, formally file the application to investigate the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum heist. Uh, it's nice of him to um, give you the freedom to do that. In- there's, can I interrupt you just for a moment? I'd use the word informally. Gotcha. Never been really <laughs> told, <laughs> you know, get on with it and, and here's a pot of money to do it with. No, no, it's it's informal. It's in my own time. I'm in my mid seventies. You know, what else have I got to do that's worth doing? Well, I mean, you know, being a decent human being, I suppose, and trying to be a decent grandfather and husband and father. Well, you you can be all of those plus the guy who gets the uh Gardner Museum art back on the wall. So that that'd be a nice uh, cherry on top, I think. Oh, we'll see. Yeah. And also, I, there's another thing I've been involved in over the past two decades, and that's the recovery of a painting that was stolen. In fact, a few months after I came back from Vietnam, it was October 1969, and the um, oratory of San Lorenzo, the oratory of St. Lawrence in Palermo, was hit in a huge, very fine Caravaggio depiction of the, of the nativity was stolen. I'm working on that. And also, since it was stolen about 10 years ago, there's a Van Gogh painting stolen in Cairo um, of yellow flowers and red poppies. And I want to get that back. So, you know, those are, so obviously the, the garden, 
museum pictures are the, are the main ones, but there are other things I'm working on as well. Yeah, and you've uh, helped to return some some real masterpieces. Can, would you mind giving giving us a little bit uh, of the story on how you helped to return uh, the scream? Well, I was a police officer then. Um, in fact, I was based at Europol when it was stolen in February 1994. Um, and I, well, I commuted weekends at home. And then during the week, I was in The Hague at the Europol headquarters. Uh, on that Sunday, um, I listened to the news before I headed off on the Monday morning. And I, I puzzled about, well, why did anybody want to steal the scream? And when I got into my office in, in The Hague, I... Uh, at Europol headquarters, I had a phone call from a colleague at Scotland Yard, um, who was the head of the uh, Art and Antique Squad at the time at the Yard, and he said to me, um, you know, uh, "I'm, I'm going to call the uh, Norwegian police in Oslo and give them our, you know, an offer of assistance. Well, you know, can we come up with a plan?" So I, I thought about it for a while. I said, "Yeah, sure." Um, to tell the Norwegian police that we, we can get into these people and pretend we're from the Getty Museum in California and that the Getty Museum, knowing that the Norwegian government couldn't pay any ransom demand if one was to suddenly arrive, certainly the Getty Museum, which at the time and probably still is the wealthiest private institution organization in the art world. And um, he thought that was a great idea. So anyway, that's, that was the plan. Um, and it, it worked. Uh, I arrived in, Oslo, and uh, I was the guy from the Getty, and uh, you know it worked, it worked very well. And I, we were quite surprised by how relatively little the uh, ransom demand was uh, for the recovery of the painting. But um, I was quite pleased that when I eventually saw it. I, in fact, it was brought up from a basement of a summer house in, in a town called Ashgardstrand, which is south of Oslo on the on Oslo Fjord. And uh, it was just me and the guy that brought it up this, from his secret little bunker down there. And he handed it to me, it was wrapped in a, in a blue sheet. So I put it on, well, it, it was first week of May in 1994. So the, everything's all dust covers all over his summer house, over the furniture. So I put it on what was always his um, dining room table. And I took the, the blue sheet off. And what I hadn't known, I'd done a fair amount of research on the painting. But what I had not known is that Monk had started it on the back. So the first thing I saw was just that central figure of the screen in black. And obviously Monk didn't quite like it. So he turned it over. And in fact, I did exactly the same thing. I turned it over and boom, there it was. And, and what I had memorized, because you wouldn't be able to blow out a candle twice the same way, is where Monk had blown out a candle on his original version of the screen. I looked straight for that because I'd memorized how the the wax blobs had stuck to the, to the to the work, and it was exactly as I had memorized it should be. But anyway, whenever you see a, a masterpiece work of art, no matter how reprehensible the painter may be, and Edvard Munch was seriously reprehensible, but the painting jumps out at you and t t tells you itself it's a masterpiece. And so I held it and said, yeah, okay. And we went to a hotel. In fact, the hotel's in one of Munch's other paintings, uh, three little girls on a pier um, looking at the hotel in the distance. And that was the hotel where I, I, I put it in. I, I told him to go forth and multiply with himself and I'd get hold of my friends in Oslo. And sure enough, and the cops turned up and, and they were very pleased. And um, we drove back to Oslo. It was about 50 miles south of Oslo. And that's how I got it back. What's that like when you know that you're about to recover this? I mean, is your adrenaline just pumping? Yeah, in, in, in that particular case, once I had barricaded myself into a room, a day room at the um, at that hotel, I went into the mini bar of, and you know checked out what was to drink. There was no vodka, which broke my heart. And then um, I tried the wine, and Jesus wept. It was that it was that stuff ghastly? But anyway, I poured myself a drink about ten in the morning. Damn. Well, if there if there's any reason to drink at ten in the morning, it's uh, when you recover the scream. <laughs> that's impressive that that's truly impressive i noticed you got a little uh figurine of the uh central character in the screen behind you is am i seeing this right i've got a blow up doll some i think one of my uh, either my son or one of my daughters gave it to me i had a question about the route that you uh 
we're confident that the uh, Gardner paintings went. You said from Halifax, they were in a shipping container and they went over to uh, Limerick, uh, County Limerick. Uh, is that where you believe they currently are or did they move from there? No, 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 no. They, they moved across Ireland to, um, to the Dublin area. No, it's just um, up the Shannon River there at Limerick, there's a, a container port. And then from there, it went down to the, the Dublin area. Across to the Dublin area. And uh, the one brother who who you believe was murdered, was, was he murdered over these paintings? No, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the reason for his, his death. I mean, I can only speculate. And, you know, I, 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 think, I, I don't think that the, the, these pictures had anything to do with it. Okay. But I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm wondering how how it got from their hands in, in that um, boat. I guess uh, going from Halifax to Ireland, and then the brothers seem to have both lost uh, the control of the paintings. No, the the, the the brother that organized all of this is I think only lost control when he when he when he died. Okay. Up until that moment, yeah, he was in pretty much full control of that, but he certainly was a. Involved in a, in a variety of things that um, I, I suspect led to his death. I, I don't know what they are, and um, and of course, for me, it's entirely irrelevant. The only thing I'm interested in, frankly, is is, is the safe recovery of these things without any further damage, and certainly without anybody being um, injured or, or, or murdered themselves. And I suppose one more thing, and I also want to ensure that the that the wrong people are not blamed, and that would be the. Um, you know, the, the Patriarcha family and uh, for the name of the other family in the Boston area. Well, I think that they were both from Providence, Rhode Island. But, uh, but the Italian um, mafia, I think, had nothing to do with it. Even though, you know, stupidly, people in the Boston mob have claimed an involvement and people have been running around over the past 30 years assuming that what they say is more or less true. I don't think it's true at all. But on, on the other hand, it's also, I believe, true that the um, Irish nationalists um, as an organization and as a cause had nothing to do with this as well. This was entirely two freelance Comanches. So the the one brother that you said had control over it right up until the point where he died, was he dealing them? And the control that he had, is that something that will help you once you understand what he did with them to get them back? Um, or, or was he just sort of the gatekeeper for them? Yeah, I, I, not quite. The way you've you, you pictured it at the moment, or depicted it, um, but he did have you know the idea that they would come in useful one day, uh, without doubt. And that's why they were taken. One of the reasons why they were taken. Also because you know, like that man that um, tried to climb up Mount Everest once and, and died before he got to the top. Uh, he said when he was asked, "Well, why do you want to climb Mount Everest?" He said, "Because it's there." Well, I think you know, two guys on R and R in the New England area, knowing about art theft they decided to try it for themselves and they did and it's certainly i think it's fairly regarded as the um, as, as the biggest art heist certainly in u.s history but also um you know modern modern history has been except for the of course the nazis stealing art from the people they murdered the jewish families they murdered this is the biggest art heist of the 20th century so where where do you um where do you begin when you're trying to put forth the best effort to recover these paintings. You you knew that they were in the Dublin area. What's your first step? Do you start making phone calls or, or do you just sort of observe? No, I, I generally write to people. Um, that's what I've done in the past, um, in, ever since I left the police. I don't get involved in any undercover work. I mean, that's just crazy. I don't need to. I, you know, it's counterproductive. Um, certainly would be for me. So I, I, I simply, you know, drop people a line and, you know, explain who I am and say, you know, this is what I've done in the past and, um, and, and this is what I'm interested in. And if there's any way they could help me, well, here are my contact details. And by and large, you know, people ring me. They say, oh, well, thanks for the letter. I yeah, understand. And then we talk. And at first, of course, they're very guarded. They don't know who I am. And, you know, they may think, you know, I'm doing this on behalf of the FBI or, you know, the local police or something. Well, I'm not, but I, I do it. And, and also, I'm, I'm not doing it on, well, I am in a way doing it on behalf of the Gardner Museum, but, but I'm not I'm not an employee of the Gardner Museum. I'm just a, 
I suppose you'd say. I'm also a freelance Comanche. I'm just doing it because the, somebody needs to do it and I'm good at it. And I, and I find this um, worthwhile doing. And, 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 and then we talk in those terms. In fact, I talk to them exactly like I'm talking to you. You know, modeled stream of consciousness. You know, you, you think this is a public reading of Samuel Beckett or something, the way I talk sometimes. But... Um, <laughs> Well, it's, you've, you've given me a very calm feeling. You're you're very uh, you know deliberate, kind of stoic in your uh, your approach. Uh, very trustworthy immediately, I'd say. I'm about to confess to the uh, to the heist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I'm so comfortable. I'm I'm about to tell you what I did with the uh, with the paintings. Well, I, I imagine being being likable is uh, something that that did come in handy in undercover work, though. Uh, I, I think, sure, I, I agree with you. Being engaging is, is important. I am curious about the involvement of Martin the Viper Foley. He's been popping up on our radar here and there as we've been covering the Gardner heist, and he recently came into the news in, in regards to this. You've been communicating with him, correct? Uh, not recently, but yes, yeah, certainly I was in touch with him up until about February this year. But then he had to do a runner. Um, the police told him he was going to be murdered. And, he, you know, people have tried to murder him in the past. So he took the police advice and he disappeared. And what kind of guy is this? For anyone who's listening who does not know who Martin the Viper Foley, I, I, I'm assuming you don't earn the nickname the Viper because you're, a, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a, 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 you know, soft, cuddly, uh, grandfatherly type. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll put my cards on the table about Martin. I like the guy. I'm aware that he's had a criminal record that goes back over 50 years. And um, I'm aware that he did um, violently beat up a, a police officer and member of the guard of Shakona uh, some years ago and destroyed the guy's life essentially. He didn't kill him, but you know, he had to leave the police and so forth. But I think that um, over the years, as he's aged, he's, in, in my view, and now, you know, I have a small confession to make to you and your listeners. I am what you would call a churchy bastard. And what that means is I'm not overly religious, but I'm religious enough to think that there is some truth in uh, what Jewish, Muslim, and Christian brothers and sisters of mine might think about the meaning of life. And in particular, I think the, the notice of, the, the, the sort of, excuse me, the idea of, of redemption does, along with his legacy of both his family and um, general posterity. Martin thinks he's pushing 70. It's time he um, did something that everyone would admire. And I've encouraged him to think that. I mean, you know, be straight. I mean, I haven't sort of stuck an Are You Saved track on his ass as he stands up and walks around the room. But I do think that there is something to, um, you know, to, to, to help him think, yeah, there, there's more to life than, than, than what he's done. And, um, and and if he can help with the gardener, the recovery of the Gardner Museum things, I'm, I'm hoping that he will. I, I know he's got some problems at the moment, but um, <laughs> well, he's always had problems. So I don't know what's new. He, um, I, I think he will help. What does he know? Does, does he know where they are currently or did he know um, a, a route in which they took to be where they're at currently? Well, I mean, He's not some kind of police informant. He's not, I wouldn't describe him as an informant, but he and I have talked about things and, and, and he told me he was, um, he did know the, the, the guy whose plan it was to, to, to break into the um, Guardian Museum posing as a police officer and um, the, the one who was murdered in Amsterdam. I'm fairly sure he was murdered in Amsterdam. He was a friend of his. So you can uh, connect us with Martin and get, a, get an interview with him, right? Well, give us... His phone number or something? No, he's <laughs> he's he's on the run. <laughs> right. What a life. But what knowing the kind of guy he is, it, you know, it's, you know, there's a swimming pool nearby, and you know, the sun shining. Unlike in Boston and London at the moment. <laughs> oh, going, yeah. Worcester, Mass. You're in Worcester, Mass, aren't you? Our studios in Worcester, yeah. So I don't think the sun is shining there at the moment. Unless it could be, I guess. Nice fall day. Nope it's it's snowing. Yeah, you'd be yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> yep, we've gotten about four inches of snow. I live in London. I don't see it much. <laughs> Is it mostly yeah. rain? And, and and when it turns to snow, it turns to slush immediately. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I guess we're, we're lucky in that it's real pretty out here. It's stuck on the trees still. Great. 
that that was one of my favorite parts in the uh, in the the BBC doc. I, and I know you're not a big fan of it, the billion dollar art hunt. But uh, but when you called um, Foley with uh, with John Wilson, I thought that was really. Um, I, I burst out laughing when uh, when he was like, "So he's gone," and you were like, "For fuck's sake! I, I know he's not answering the phone. Uh, you know, <laughs> what do you want me to do?" <laughs> that part was great. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I did lose my. I was a little short with um, poor old John Wilson, but you know, he was asking for it. But the main thing is, um, you know, I, you know, I told obviously Martin. I didn't lie to him. I was there with Wilson. Wilson wanted to talk to him, and the conversation actually went on for much longer than the damn documentary suggests. And he just, you know, went on and on, banging on about immunity from prosecution and, um, you know, so on and on. I don't know. I, I don't, I just can't imagine, I, I can't see how, given Irish laws as they are, the 2005 Criminal Justice Act and the 2006 Criminal Justice Act, one dealt with terrorist defenses and the other with organized crime. But both of them had sections to deal with benefiting from the proceeds of criminal conduct. And if you read those two acts, passed by the Doyle, the Irish Parliament, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see that there's, you know, there's, there's no wriggle room there. You know, you're guilty as hell. Um, and it, it, this is something that's going to have to be dealt with. Uh, that wonderful expression of President Obama's at, at, at above my pay grade. <laughs> I just, you know, I just, I don't know how people will, um, I just don't know how pe people are going to work this out. But I think, I, I have some confidence in, in Andrew Lelling, who's the U.S. Attorney from Massachusetts. And um, and I met a great guy who's a retired uh, director of public prosecutions in Ireland named James Hamilton. And I had a good talk to him as well, with, with John Wilson present, his crew. And, um, and and I would have thought that the people like James Hamilton, his successor is the director of public prosecutions, and uh, U.S. Attorney um, Andrew Lelling, I'm sure they could work out something. It's 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 so important. I mean, and obviously those those laws were passed not in order to prevent the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum masterpieces from being recovered. I mean, it just it's just the, the, the problem with the reward. I think more than anything else will be a bone yeah. of contention. And would an itemized reward price list help? I, I think Anthony Moore has done an itemized price list, but I you know. I wouldn't, um, I mean, it all depends on the condition these things are recovered in and all sorts of imponderables at the moment that will have to be pondered in the future. But I'm confident, and, and you may think I'm some just another arrogant son of a bitch who's overly confident, but I do think these things will come back and that these um, issues will be resolved in a, in a reasonable manner. What do you think could be done to motivate anyone who knows where one or all of the pieces are to return that because uh, let's say someone has the finial but they don't have you know the the uh storm on the sea of galilee what what can incentivize them to return that without getting in in trouble like how how would you be able to explain that to to this person is is that even reasonable to consider well it's, it's certainly reasonable to consider but i think they're all together i think everything is together i mean i think that that, that Chinese, ancient Chinese beaker is probably broken and, you know, it'll rattle when somebody picks up the, you know, whatever it's wrapped in. Um, the finial will be fine. I mean, that's, that's solid brass. Uh, and so far as the, those pictures are concerned, the masterpieces and the other ones, um, which are all very valuable, it really depend on what kind of condition that they're, they're in. And, and of course, over three decades, they're not going to be in museum quality conditions, that's for sure. I, I just think that you know things will be able to be worked out, and um, it's just a matter of doing it cautiously and deliberately, and, and ensuring that no further damage is done, that no one is injured or you know, worse, and finally that um, the reputations of people who've been blamed in the past, or maybe people may think are, should be blamed now, that those reputations are not sullied because they, after all they had nothing to do with it. Yeah, yeah, totally, and. I, I tend to agree with you about them being together, like all together, because they've never been used individually. You've never even heard a rumor of them being used individually to lower a prison sentence or, you know, to barter something. Um, which brings me to my point that, that you had mentioned before about one of the gentlemen saying uh, one of the gentlemen holding on to them because he knew that there would be a use for them in the future. If they're all together, I guess he never found that use. Um, is that part of the recovery process is to, 
get the ear of the person who knows where they're at to, and, and say, listen, there's never been a use before for these things. They're almost too hot to handle now. Like you'd never be able to get away with it now. I mean, everyone's looking for it. Is that like a bargaining tool that you would use? Well, I think, frankly, it was um, they were too hot from the moment they were stolen to be used in any credible way. Um, I know other people talk about, you know, bartering this, that, and the other for something else and using things, um, you know, as a you know, collateral for a loan, all, all those sort of things. I've, I've known that to happen in the past, but, I, but with these particular works of art, no, it's, it ain't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen. And it was a mistake for someone to even think that they could do it, this with them or that with them. So I guess that would be something that might incentivize whoever knows where they're at because there's no use to keep them, right? It, I think the, the, the main draw is probably the reward it, you know, because it's a large amount of money. I mean, it's big, big bucks, uh, 10 million. Yeah, the problem with that is that it's uh, $10 million if they're returned altogether in, in good condition, and they'll never be in good condition. Like, just the evidence of how they were removed from the frames suggests that they are not in good condition. So maybe it just needs to be tweaked a little bit. Do you have any thoughts on that, that the, the recovery process that's implemented by the museum, that after, you know, a decade and a, oh, I'm sorry, after a few decades, they need to figure out a different way to uh, get the paintings back and, and provide incentives and just tweak the parameters and say, Maybe not good condition, because we know that's impossible, but maybe recoverable, restorable condition? Well, people do great things these days with conservation and restoration work. Tremendous things. I mean, remember that terrible earthquake in Assisi some years ago, when they really got to work on, you know, Chinabui and the rest of them, Giotto, all, all their works in, in, in the Basilica of Assisi. And, um, and I've been there since, since the, that work has um, been done, and it's terrific. And, and also in... Um, Padua, there's a church that was hit by, a, I can't remember what was the RAF or the U.S. Army Air Force, or maybe both, in Padua, uh, the Hermitage of uh, St. Jerome, and um, there's a fantastic uh, painting on the wall by Mantegna. Well, that was just, you know, became rubble. And, um, and some brilliant ma Italian mathematician with his algorithms worked out how to put it all back together again. And it's not all back together again, but it's, it's back together enough. And when you go into the, um, the church, quite near the Arena Chapel, the Scrivini Chapel, and uh, uh, and it's you know amazing. I mean, it's unfortunate that the church happened to be next to the Gestapo headquarters and the, or the Wehrmacht headquarters in Padua at the time when the um, Allied Air Forces whacked it. But, um, but but getting back to the paintings, I mean, it's, some tremendous work can be done these days uh, in in restoration and conservation. Absolutely. And I, I can think of a few companies that are local right in Boston. Uh, I wonder if any of these companies would put up some sort of um, offer saying if these are if these are returned in any condition that we can uh, save them, maybe they can provide that service for free. Some restoration firm or even like a 3D printing uh, firm. 3D printing might be able to pull something off with restoring it to some sort of condition that is uh, close to what it originally was. But Oh, maybe maybe that's something that we can put a call out for. You know, there there are firms that restore paintings and they do a really good job and maybe they would offer their services to bring it back to something that was uh, almost like it was originally. Well, ask them. I, I, I just don't know. I, I've got my doubts. I, that Caravaggio I mentioned to you early on, uh, the, um, the nativity scene that was stolen from um, the Oratory of St. Lawrence in Palermo in October 1969, that has been um, a, a copy, a 3D, you know, copy has been put back in the, in the oratory. Um, and it, it looks pretty dreadful to me. I, it's not it's not as bad as a huge photograph they had of a painting there before that. But uh, no, I, I, I think as far as that Caravaggio is concerned, although that'll be in terrible state. It's, you know, 50 years, more than 50 years uh, since it was stolen. But um, I'd, I'd put my, my faith in restorers and conservators who, if you could get all the bits together, could actually, you know, re rebuild that painting by Caravaggio. Right. I hope. I, I don't know. So are there any changes that you would make to the Gardner artwork uh, reward structure? No, I'd, I'd, I'd leave all of that entirely to the Gardner Museum trustees, Yeah. Uh, you know, with advice from Anthony, their head of security and um, 
and the input from um, uh, the FBI and, and, of course, the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in Boston. And the lawyers would be able to figure it out. I doubt it, but, you know, everybody, including lawyers, could figure it out. I would have thought better than just lawyers alone. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any great faith in lawyers. So. Okay. <laughs> it's a personal thing. So, so I, I know they charge a lot of money for what they do, but, you know, I'm not su suggesting that I think that their work is always brilliant. <laughs> sure. All right. So your your recovery uh, process is starting to shape a little bit more uh, defined in my in my head right now because we do focus a lot on what the museum could do as far as adjusting the re the recovery qualifications for the art to be returned. That's pretty irrelevant in your head, though. Correct? You're because we're thinking about it in terms of someone knows where they're at; they just need the incentive to return them, and the museum can provide the incentive, but you know where they're at. You just need to work with that person, regardless of what the museum's doing, right? I think, yes, I, I think that's the understanding I have with um, Anthony Amore on behalf of the you know, Garden Museum trustees, that I'd, I'll just crack on with what I'm doing. If I'm right, I'm right. If I'm wrong, well, you know, they, they told me so. <laughs> right. So how, how big is the area where you think they're at uh, in Southern Ireland? Oh, I think they're in the Dublin area. And the Dublin area, Dublin is about the same size as Boston, right? Small, slightly smaller. Slightly smaller than Boston. Okay, so I can picture that, like maybe a Providence, Rhode Island, something like that, slightly smaller than Boston. What do you do? Like, do you have messages out to people to to contact you, or are you are you just playing? Are you are are you in that like moment where you need that patience? No, you got me in a slightly difficult position here at the moment because, I, in fact, I'm doing quite a bit of them with regard to the Gardner Museum pictures right now. Um, but I don't want to tell you what it is. And it's not because, you know, I think you're going to blow me out of the water or, you know, anything like that. It's just that I think it would be imprudent of me to tell you what I'm doing because I'm other than to say the reason I'm on this podcast with you and I'm, I'm grateful to you for inviting me along is, is to emphasize the fact that the, um, that both, um, Italian-American organized crime and Irish-American uh, nationalist support for paramilitaries in Ireland, um, those two groups had nothing to do with this. I mean, oh, there's a tenuous connection between the two guys who, who actually did the job and, and, and you know, the, as active service unit guys from the IRA, they were there on essentially, you know, a holiday. You know, well, I've called it R&R &R and that's more what it was than anything else. But, um, but, you know, their, their organizations had nothing to do with this or what they did. And I think to, to assuage or to allay the, the concerns of people, reputational concerns, is, is, is the most important thing I can do at the moment with you, if that's all right. I'm, I'm, in other words, I'm, I'm using you, if you forgive me, but I'm, I'm, I want to try and get that message across. No, please feel free. Uh, we uh, we appreciate just talking to you and, and hearing stories and really being as close as we are right now um to the gardener art um so feel free to use us again if you'd like um <laughs> if if that's what uh what you want to call it but um along those lines I, I would love to ask you about the uh recovery of the uh the titian rest on the flight to europe to uh egypt yeah i um that was stolen from a, from a big house in the west of england called longleat which was owned by um lord bath and his ancestors he was quite a character but he he, he died a year or so ago and um it sounds now, now that the new Lord Bath, but anyway, they had three pictures on a wall, the Titian and two other 16th century paintings. And um, they were stolen on, um, on 12th night. So that's January the 6th, 1980, oh, 1995. Seven years later, I got it back. When I, in fact, no, this is, this is something that the reason I'm also talking to you is I know that talking to people on programs like yours works. Because I had spoken um, about the the, um, the rest on the flight uh, into Egypt by Titian uh, on a radio program, and I'll be damned if somebody didn't contact the the presenter and say, "Well, I know where it is," and and so he said, "Well, uh, you know," he gave the guy my contact details. I went to see the the fellow, and I said, "All right, um, you know, maybe we can do something." And I, I contacted the um, the insurers and the, um, the the land agent, as he's called. 
uh, at Longleat, um, who discussed it with the Lord Bath, and um, they said, you know, yeah, you know, get on with it. So I did, and sure enough, this thing appeared in a red, white, and blue nylon sort of plasticky bag at a bus stop outside Richmond uh, Railroad Station, which is where I live in London, um, and an old guy there with white hair. Uh, I was with the fellow I'd been dealing with. I got out of my car and went over to him and I said, well, I'm told by the guy I'm with, this is a, you got a picture here that belongs to somebody else. Um, and he just handed it to me, didn't say a word. So I went, got back in my car with the bag and put it between myself and the, my passenger. And he said, well, aren't you going to look at it? So I, I pulled outside, I pulled outside of Starbucks <laughs> in Richmond High Street. <laughs> and I, and I said, okay, you know, the double yellow lines. Anyway, I, I said, well, I opened up the bag and, I, and it was wrapped up in brown paper. So I just kind of tore the paper carefully and I looked and there was the corner of the painting. And I said, look, that's painted by Titian. And I bet the rest of it was as well. So, you know, I, I gave it to him to hold. We went back to my office and both um, Lord Bath's lawyer and his land agent were there in my office. And we took all the brown paper off, and sure enough, there it was. And so, and and they they you know wired to his to an account he had the reward. Damn, I I'm I get like an adrenaline rush hearing you tell the stories. I, well, when I tell you what I did then, and I, I I took the lawyer down to his office in her smart address in Lincoln's Inn Fields. The, the, the lawyers, um, uh, uh, Farrar and Company, they're the Queen's lawyers. Anyway, so um. It's all very upmarket, and um, so you know, took the took the picture there and left him and drove home, and um, and then they had a little press conference, and you know, everybody danced around it, and that was that. So it, I, I want to play a hypothetical game uh, before we wrap up. Let's say your your episode airs, and then two days later you get a call the the episode that we're doing right now, and two days later you get a call, and the person says. I got something to show you. It's in reference to that podcast episode you just did. And they give you an address. What's your next step? Do you call police? Do you call a friend to, you know, maybe be a witness? What's your next step if you were to get a tip? Well, it, it, it would entirely depend on what was said to me. Entirely. So I, I can't tell you what I would say immediately because I... Obviously, I wouldn't know what they would say, but you know, I've got the idea of what you, what you say, and and I would say, right, well, I'd better go and take a look. You, you want to come with me, you know, or ask somebody to come with me that you know and trust, and I, I, that's how I'd play it. And I'd say, well, I, I can't come straight away because flying from London to Dublin's a pain in the ass at the moment because it's, you know, you you, you get to Dublin, you got to tell them where you're going to stay for the next fourteen days and uh, and all of that, the the, the COVID stuff, and. Um, I know that the current lockdown in Dublin should end on December the 2nd. So it's just a month's time and I'll, um, I'll come over right after that. So, you know, I suppose you could say that's playing it long. I think it would be foolhardy, downright foolish to inform the, the Irish police, the Dublin police. Although I think because I've got a good rapport with Anthony Amore, I'd, I'd let Anthony know, you know, what, pretty much has been said to me and what my plan is. Um, I mean, after all, he might like to think, oh, that's great, that's what we've been waiting for. He might like to fly over to Dublin himself. Mind you, he'd have the same problems between now and December the 2nd that I'd have, which is, you know, what would you tell, you tell Irish authorities you're gonna stay in one hotel for the next two weeks and for lockdown, you know, so all the crap that's going on at the moment, you know, you gotta work, you've gotta factor that in as well. Right, right. And I'm, I'm assuming that your next call pretty quickly after Anthony Amore would be to us, right? That would be, if that wasn't your first call. <laughs> I would certainly ring you to thank you. That's for sure. <laughs> I would be on a plane so fast. <laughs> well, uh, Charlie, yeah, this has been, uh, this has been really great uh, getting to spend some time with you and to, uh, to talk about stolen art, art recovery, and uh, the gardener art with you. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say before uh, we wrap up? Well, Tim and, and Lance, I'd, I'd just appreciate you know your your time and and, and my opportunity to, to speak. I and I know that I, I tend to ramble, but you know I, I think I've said everything I, I want to say. And 
and this and, and and my main concern and my main interest in being on your program was to try and allay the suspicions people have that their reputations are going to be impaired no it's, you know this is just something that needs to be done now and can be done and and, and the wrong people do not need to be blamed for it